each one of you. And uh, it's a blessing to be here. It's a blessing to have heat, to be warm. <laughs> and uh, I'm so glad that that windstorm passed a few days ago. We're not having to deal with that tonight. Mm -hmm. So I'm very thankful for that. Uh, I was amazed that more trees didn't fall with, uh, with the amount of wind we had. That was amazing. <clears throat> so I'm looking forward to continue our presentation here on the sanctuary. And uh, if you have a moment, let's bow our heads and uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we pause to thank you again for the great love you have for each one. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful truths that you have for us in your Bible. And Lord, um, again, we come before you thanking you so much for the sacrifice made on our behalf. We thank you for Jesus, and we pray again, Lord, for his grace, uh, the precious blood of Christ to wash away all our sin and for his righteousness to cover us. And Lord, we're entering into yet another step in the sanctuary. Again, we pray for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit, illuminate our minds, and uh, keep us focused. I thank you for these things. Keep the evil one at bay, that he will not interfere and annoy, and may it be your voice that we always hear. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I hope you're getting as excited and enthusiastic about the sanctuary as, as I have been over the years and continue to be. I, uh, I, I am, I've reached the place, uh, the belief that, um, that if you can't explain the plan of salvation to a child, it's because you don't know it. Because the Lord gives it to us in a very simple way to understand. And I'm so thankful for the sanctuary because uh, the sanctuary just breaks it down in very simple parts and helps us to understand how to have a relationship with Jesus and, uh, and to understand his plan to, rec to reclaim us from sin. And so we learned that the outer court teaches us how to become a Christian and we're learning that the holy place teaches us how to remain one. And uh, uh, the first component we looked at was the menorah, the role of the Holy Spirit in the life. Um, then we studied about the table of showbread that, of course, we learned that man shall not live by bread, on, uh, bread alone, but by every what? Word. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And we need the, the, we need the word of God. And we find that the Holy Spirit um, works in conjunction with God's word and never contrary to it. And tonight we're going to look at the third component, and that is the golden altar. The golden altar, maybe I should look over here, but I don't know if you can all see that, uh, stood before uh, the veil. Maybe you can see it here better. Can you all see that? The golden altar was there. And the priest would place incense on the golden altar in the morning and, the, uh, and in the evening during the uh, beginning of the sanctuary services for the day and at the end of the daily services. And on the other side of that curtain was the presence of God over the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, the priest's work at the golden altar on a daily basis brought him closer to the presence of God than any of his activities that he was involved in during the daily process. And so we're going to take a look today at uh, what is the lesson there? What is it that God wants us to learn uh, at the Golden Hour term? What role does it play uh, in our walk with Jesus? And so we're going to begin with question uh, number one. We're going to take a look there at the altar of incense. And question number one uh, asks, the, who was to offer the incense on the altar. Exodus 30, verse 7 and 8 says, what's the first word? Aaron. Aaron shall burn on its sweet incense every morning when he tends the lamps. He shall burn incense on it. And when Aaron lights the lamps at twilight, 
He shall burn incense on it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. And so, and when the sanctuary services began each morning, when they ended at the end of the day, that's when the priest would place the incense on the golden altar. It was part of his activities, his work in the daily. And uh, just a quick review on the daily. You remember the day began with a... Uh, a burnt offering, it ended with a burnt offering, and the burnt offering is, a, is an offering of consecration. We're going to talk more about that in a moment. And then uh, the priest, of course, would wash his hands and feet before he ministered in the tabernacle or at the brazen altar. He made sure that the menorah had oil, that it was well lit, made sure the bread of presence was there, and then he placed the uh, incense. That was the daily activities. So while the priest was doing this, what were the people doing? Let's take a look at question number two. What did the multitude do at the hour of incense in the morning and evening service? Luke 1, 9 and 10 tells us, according to the custom of the priesthood, this is referring to Zacharias, by the way, we're coming in the middle of a discussion, but Zechariah was, uh, was the priest in charge of the morning and evening uh, incense. Uh, you remember this incident is when the angel appears to tell him that his wife, Elizabeth, is going to give birth to John the Baptist. That's the incident here. We're coming in the middle of that. But anyway, it gives us some insight as to this word. So again, according to the custom of the priesthood, his, Zechariah's lot, fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were doing what? Praying. Praying, Praying outside at the hour of incense. And so while the priest... The braze, while the the um, the lamb, the burnt offering was was being given, um, the people outside at that moment, as the priest was laying the incense, were doing what? Praying. They were praying outside, and so that burnt offering was a was actually an offering of dedication, and so what was happening is that the people were outside <coughs> dedicating themselves to the Lord for that day. They were, they were bringing their petitions to the Lord. Really what was happening is that Israel was taught to begin and end their day in prayer. The Lord taught them that. To begin and end their day in prayer. And so they understood this. And, and really what the priest is doing here on, on their behalf is being a mediator. In what way, Pastor? Well, what does the incense symbolize? King David tells us. Psalms 141. Let my prayers be set before you as what? Incense. As incense. And so, <clears throat> as, as he's placing the incense on that golden altar, it had a very nice smell. And in fact, uh, the Lord referred to it as something sweet smelling, which was to indicate to us that our prayers are very precious to him. They are very precious to him. And uh, so the priest was the one then, because God's trying to teach us something, right? The priest was the one then who would place that incense on the golden altar that ascended before God, who was on the other side of the uh, curtain, indicating to us that it was that priest who presented those prayers to, uh, to God, right? So he was being a mediator for the people who was asking the prayers. So what was God trying to communicate to us in all of this? Well, who does the priest represent? Number four, who does Paul say the priest represents? 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one what? Mediator, Mediator between God and man, the man who? Christ Jesus. Is Christ, so, Christ Jesus. So now Paul's going to flesh it out for us a little more in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 7, 24 and 25. It says, but he who? Jesus. Jesus, because he continues how long? Forever. Forever. Has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he ever lives to make intercession for them. Uh, so Jesus... Paul tells us in the heavenly sanctuary is our mediator. When you and I pray, Christ is the one who mingles our prayers with his righteousness and presents them to the Father. You know, I want to I wanna share something with you that's amazing. You don't have to go through a pastor, an earthly pastor or an earthly priest when you want to talk to God. You can go directly to your mediator in heaven and he will present your prayers for you to the Father. Is that not awesome? Mm -hmm. 
We all have access, free access, to Christ, our mediator, every one of us. You know, that, that thing that Paul says here, there's a number of words here to me that are so amazing. Paul says, for he is also able to say to what? The uttermost. <clears throat> this to me is amazing. Wouldn't it have been accurate and enough if he had said, for he is also able to save those who come to him through, uh, who come to God through him? Isn't that a true statement? But he adds, uh, he is able to save to the uttermost. He adds that. What is Paul saying? No matter how big a sinner you have been, God can reach down and pull you up. No matter how far you've fallen, he can reach down deeper still. Isn't that awesome? I love that. And then there's something else it says here. Since he ever lives to make intercession for them. Wouldn't it have been accurate if he said, and he lives to make intercession for him? But he ever lives. In other words, it's his joy to intercede for you and me. It's not a bother to him. I'm so thankful. You ever ask somebody a question that you know that you have to ask, but you know it's going to bug them? And you're kind of, how can I, there's no way around it, you know, you're going to have to go on. It's not that way with God. He ever lives. He looks, this is his joy, is to intercede on our behalf. Let's keep going. So what we're seeing here is the third component of our, of, uh, of, of our walk with God. Uh, how we remain a Christian. It's not only asking for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit each day and spending time in His Word, but it's spending time communicating with God. Have you ever talked... So, so, so prayer is communicating with God. Is that right? Yes. Um, have you ever talked to somebody or, or, or had a conversation with someone and it was a one-way conversation? You couldn't get anything in? Right? And, and so, you know, the Lord have, wants to communicate with us too. <laughs> right? And so we communicate with Him through prayer, but He communicates to us through His Word. I, I'm going to say this kindly. It's amazing to me how many Christians are out there that call themselves Christians and spend no time listening to God. Now remember what I've said in the past. I can stand in the middle of my garage and call myself a car, but it doesn't make me one. And, and, and if I go to church and call myself a Christian, that really doesn't make me one. It's Christ that makes me a Christian as I spend time with Him, yielding my life to His leading in my life. Does that make sense? And so, so this is the component in walking with God. And I am so thankful I have the privilege that I can talk to my Heavenly Father anytime, anywhere. So, so really what the golden altar is, what... What, it was a, an appeal to Israel. It was a call to Israel to pray. But it's also a call to God's people today to pray. To talk to the Lord. So let's take a look at uh, God's invitation. The call to pray. Question number five. What is God's invitation to us? Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 says, <clears throat> Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our what? Confession. Confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come how? Boldly. Boldly. That means with confidence. <coughs> to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know, it is so wonderful to know that when we talk to Jesus, He understands what it's like to be a human being. He understands the struggles. I don't know if you ever put much thought into this. <clears throat> but, but Jesus, in principle, experienced the whole gamut of, the human, of human existence, of the human experience. He experienced the whole gamut, what you're saying, Pastor. What I'm saying is this. One day, by the grace of God, when we, when, we, when we get to heaven, there will never be a human being who will walk up to Jesus and say, you don't know what I went through. There will never be a human being that can say that. Because Jesus experienced the entire gamut of what we experience down here. He experienced for us. So he can walk rightly represent you and me and understand us. You know, have you ever had a moment in your life when God seems so far away? 
Have you ever had that moment when you felt abandoned by God? You know, it's interesting, but did you know that Jesus went through that experience? On the cross, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus knows what we feel like when we go through that, but I want to share something with you. The Bible also says that encircling the, the cross at that moment was a dark cloud. It doesn't give a lot of, it doesn't elaborate on that dark cloud, but let me fill in the gaps for you. At the moment that Jesus felt abandoned, his father was in that cloud and was closer to him at that moment than any other. And there's a lesson there for you and I, friend. It's those moments that you and I feel the most alone that our God is the closest to us. We can't make a decision based on feeling. We have to make it based on God's word. And God said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. So even though the devil may throw a dark cloud around us to make us feel alone, we can remember God's promise. He's there. He's there. You know, I'll share something with you. When I, uh, in fact, about 12 years ago, I was remembering this today. About 12 years ago, I gave birth to my first kidney stone. And that was not a joy-filled experience. And when I went to the hospital here, oh, I shouldn't have said that. I'm being recorded. Anyway, when I came to the hospital here, when I first arrived, um, the people that met me amazingly, had all passed kidney stones. <laughs> they whisked me away. They pampered me. They immediately shot me up with something <laughs> yummy to make me feel better. And they were relating to me their, their stories and their sympathy, and it was wonderful. Now later, when I was passing another kidney stone and I came, went to the hospital, nobody had passed a kidney stone. They put me off in a corner, and I arrived there in pain for hours. <laughs> when someone has been there and done that, they respond differently. Amen. And we have a Savior in the heavenly courts who's been there and done that. And when we open our hearts to Him and appeal to Him, He understands. And His response reflects that understanding. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We can pray in confidence. We have somebody on the other end who knows and cares. <clears throat> First Peter 5 7 says, casting all your care upon him. Why? He cares. Because he cares for you. Isn't that amazing? You know, I want you to think about it this way. Prayer does not bring God down <coughs> to us, it lifts us up to him. God cares. Isn't that amazing? I love that. Number six, upon what conditions are promised, uh, are we promised needed blessings? Matthew 7, uh, verse 7 and 8 says, what's the first word? Ask, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek. Seek and you will find. Knock. Knock and it will be opened unto you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him knocks, it will be open. open. I mean, they're, they're, in other words, it's telling us we have a part to play. Isn't that right? You know, when I first, um, we, have to, we have to realize that in the battle between light and darkness, there's something I term it. I term it this way. I call it rules of engagement. That's actually a military term. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but there's actually rules that are that, that have been made by nations on how to conduct warfare. You would think that's kind of funny. I mean, you kind of think that in a war, who cares about rules? <laughs> but actually, after World War One, you know, World War One, they threw everything they could get their hands on on each other, chemicals and everything else, and a lot of young men died horrible deaths. And after that war, everybody got together and said, no more chemical warfare. And then during World War II, you didn't see chemical warfare. <coughs> because it, now it doesn't, it's not that everybody didn't have it. They had it. They just didn't use it. Of course, the first one who did was going to get a pile of it by everybody else. So chemical war, warfare wasn't used. During, World, during uh, the Vietnam War, uh, one of the very uh, uh, weapons of choice was what? Do you remember? Angel Orange was one. That was, true, that's a good one. That was to, to destroy the foliage. What was the other? What was that? I said it got them too. Yeah, it did. It got a lot of our boys, a lot of our men. What else? Do you remember? It was napalm. After Vietnam, everybody got together and said, no more napalm. So these are rules of engagement. But in the spiritual warfare, there are also rules of engagement. Satan, if he could, would force himself on us. But God won't allow him. Now, we can invite him by our choices. 
But he, he cannot force himself in. He cannot make us sin. God, on the other hand, will not force himself into our lives either. He has to be invited. He's a gentleman. Does that make sense? And so we have to recognize this. That God will not violate our freedom of choice. Well, he has to be invited. And so, I remember, I don't know about you, I, I tend to, my wife's not here, I tend to lose my glasses. <laughs> yeah, I, if my daughter's around, I'm in good shape, because I'll, Sarah's like a, a bloodhound. She'll, she has great eyesight, she can find them. But the bad thing, you know, if you, if you misplace your glasses, you can't see to find them. And, um... <laughs> True. And, uh, and so sometimes I lose my keys. And the idea of asking God to help me find my glasses or my keys sounds ridiculous to me. I mean, here's God who is trying to keep, you know, he's keeping the universe from colliding into each other, you know, and planets and whatnot. And, and he's working with important leaders of state. And I'm going to ask him, do you know what my glasses are? It just seemed to me so ludicrous that I wouldn't pray. And I just fumbled around trying to find my glasses. But I had an incident that changed all that. Early in my, in, in, as I was beginning my walk with the Lord, I was living in California, so I and I were married, just newlyweds actually. And uh, I was working for um, a software company, medical software company uh, in, in Sacramento area. And I was training, I was being trained at the time, and I was out in, uh, it was near San Francisco, Oakland area, somewhere out over there along the coast. And... We had just finished our training, and the gal that was training me had to make a phone call. This was back in the day before cell phones where you needed pay phones. Anybody remember those? And, uh, and so I, uh, I was driving, and she said, we went into this shopping plaza. Just, just picture like Walmart's um, parking lot, but there were all these stores, super busy. It was after, it was like 5.30. And the place was packed, and so I went, I went in, I couldn't find a parking place. She saw a payphone and jumped out to make this call, and I'm waiting for her, and then all of a sudden I see cars coming behind me, and I'm like, oh no. So I couldn't stay there, and I had to move through that maze of cars and people walking and backing out, and, and came all the way around, and, and I came back to where she was, and she was still talking on the phone. And I thought, oh no, and I couldn't find a parking place. Looked in the rearview mirror, here comes more cars behind me, and I thought, I'm going to have to go through this again. So I had to go, I had to move, because I was blocking the way, and I drove around, and around, 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 finally came back again, I looked, she's still talking on the phone, and I still can't find a place to park. And as I'm standing there, and I know that eventually a car's going to come, and I have to go through this again, I was, it was stressing me out, a thought came to my mind to pray for a parking place. And I thought, really? That's crazy. I mean, the Lord is keeping the universe from colliding and all this other stuff, and I'm going to ask him for a parking place. But the thought kept pestering me. So finally I bowed my head and I said, Lord, I know you're busy. <laughs> but you know my situation right now. I, I, this is stressing me out. If you, can get, if, if you would give me a parking place, and I know you can do it because you made like planets, so you can give me a parking place, I really would appreciate it. And when I raised my head for my prayer, uh, this woman comes out of this, it was like a drugstore. She walks out, and as soon as the door opens, I look up, she walks up, our eyes meet, she walks over to a little Ford Mustang, fires it up, backs up, I never had to back up, and I just went into the parking place, right in front of the lady with the phone. And I sat there thinking, God cares about parking places. Are you kidding me? He would care about a parking place. Now, I had a lesson to learn, because I thought I found the ticket to finding good parking places. <laughs> and, you know, God answers our needs, not our greeds, you know. And uh, so I thought, oh, wow. So I asked, and I wasn't getting great parking places. In fact, you know, I, I had to walk miles to get to places. And I, it was as if the Lord was saying, today's a nice day. You need some exercise. <laughs> you know, so I was still learning. God is very reasonable. He's a good parent. He's a very wise parent. But he meets our needs not our greeds. And so now I pray for my glasses, and it's amazing how many times I'll get a flash in my mind of where I left them. Does anybody else have those experiences? <laughs> you get a flash right in your mind, and then you, you know exactly where they are. And it's absolutely amazing how faithful and kind God is. Take a look at the note right below 6. It says, Prayer is not an attempt to overcome God's unwillingness to help us, but rather it is taking hold of God's willingness to do so. 
Prayer is actually the opening of our heart to God like the way we do with what? A friend. God is a friend. He is. Take a look at number seven. What has God promised to do with my needs? Uh, Philippians 4.19 And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That is a tremendous promise. Sometimes we think we know what our needs are though. But God does know what our needs are. I'll share with you an incident that happened many years ago. We were living in Wilmington, North Carolina. And I had been ministering, I had been witnessing to my cousin and her husband. Her husband was a Vietnam vet. And uh, I love that man. <clears throat> and uh, my cousin had some bad experiences with religious people and wanted nothing to do with God. And I don't blame her. But I was still trying to witness to her, but she was kind of a tough nut to crack. But, but I was making, uh, but I found that her husband was receptive. And as long as she wasn't around, I could talk to him. <laughs> and, uh, and it was really, in, 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 he was beginning to listen. And well, anyway, one day, uh, uh, we were living in North Carolina, we got a phone call that, that he had had a, a massive heart attack and died at work. And my heart broke, because I loved that man so much. And I thought of my cousin, I, her world was just shattered. She, they had such a precious relationship. And I wanted to minister to her. And uh, anyway, I don't remember exactly the reason why, if they were having the funeral quickly, I, I can't remember, but I needed to be out there quickly to, 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 this, uh, to be with my cousin. We had, so and I were newlyweds, we had just bought a house, and how much money do newlyweds have that just bought a house? <laughs> and so I had like 500 bucks, and, uh, and, and I had just days to get a ticket, and so I started searching the airlines, and the tickets were, were $2,000, it was just crazy, the prices. And I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, it, I, I really feel like I need to be there for my cousin right now. And I, I only have this $500. I know nothing's too hard for you. You get me out there for 500 bucks. I said, but Lord, if you don't want me out there and you have somebody else that can minister to her better than me, fine, I'm good with that. I'll stay right here. But if not, Lord, all I have is $500. Mm -hmm. So I kept making phone calls, <laughs> and the prices were crazy. And I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll call a travel agent. Maybe they can find it. Maybe they have angles. So I called the travel agent, told her how much money I had. She, I can hear her clearing her throat, like, uh. <laughs> So anyway, so she starts making phone calls. She calls me back, and she says, look, I have a situation for you. I said, really? What's that? She says, I have an airline, uh, a flight, round trip, $500. The only catch is you have to tell them that, that instead of your uncle, that he's your brother. And so I stopped, and I said, Lord? I don't believe you need me to lie to get me there. I'm being tested. I said no to the lady. I said no, because that's not truthful. I can't do it. So she dismissed herself. She never helped me anymore. That was the end of me. <laughs> but, uh, but I figured I didn't need to lie. And, uh, and I don't need to lie. God doesn't need to lie to get me to somewhere. And so I thought, Lord, how am I going to get out there? If that's you will, if not, I get it. So I was on the phone, and I was looking at the newspaper in the classified section, and there I found a one-way ticket to Ontario, California, exactly where I needed to fly. And it was the only such ticket in the whole paper. And I said, Lord, $250, that gets me out there. I don't know how I'm going to get back, but if you get me out, I'm going to trust you're going to get me back. <laughs> and so I just figured that ticket's for me. So the next day, I got my car and I drove and I, I bought the ticket, met the lady. She gave me the ticket, $250. So I'm, I'm there. I have no idea how I'm going to get back. So my way, I was just bebopping on the way home, wasn't thinking. And I look at the ticket, my name's not on the ticket. Of course. What in the world was I thinking? It was this other lady's name. <laughs> and I'm thinking, nah, well, it didn't hurt too bad because she was like from some Scandinavian country and I couldn't even pronounce it. It wasn't like Cindy Smith. I mean, it was, I couldn't even, there was, it had most of the alphabet in it, that's all I can tell you. <laughs> and, um, and so I'm sitting here thinking, Lord, what am I going to do now? I don't like this. In fact, I was driving the health ticket up for the Lord to see it. I said, my name's not on that. And I'm not comfortable with that, Lord, but what am I going to do now? So anyway, the next day, I got my things, and, I, and my wife drops me off at the airport. <laughs> and I walk up to the counter, and I, I give him my information. A guy, you know, he gives me my tickets, whatever. And I turn around and start walking away. The only time this ever happened, me and the man says, Sir, can you come back, please? And I thought, oh. So I went back, and he said to me, What's your name? 
well, I couldn't even pronounce the thing. <laughs> and uh, so I shared with him the whole story. What, what, what had happened? He said to me, I'm sorry, but I cannot allow you to get on that plane. And I thought, well, I guess I had my answer. So he said, he said, let me see if I can find a ticket for you. And he said, uh, here, I have one here for $2,000 round trip. And I was just about to tell him, look, it's okay. It's no problem. And I took a step, and all of a sudden I heard a voice say, be quiet. And I, I didn't say anything. And the man continued. Um, well, here's one for $1,800. I didn't say anything. <sighs> Okay, here, here's one here, round trip, $800. I didn't say anything, I just stood there. And he was just getting more and more agitated. It was like he was having a conversation with somebody. Well, here's one here for $600. And I didn't say anything. <laughs> and he kept pulling with it. Finally he said, okay, you're going to be there for two weeks, $250 round trip. <laughs> $500. The Lord provided. Amen. The Lord provided. Amen. It wasn't a greed. There was a need. And I would have accepted no and trusted that he would have worked it out. But instead, he worked it out in a way. He took care of my round trip, and he let me know how long I was going to be there, because I didn't choose that. He took care of it. And I was able to minister to my cousin, and she embraced Christ as her Savior. Amen. So God, we serve a real God that really cares, and He knows our needs, and He knows how to provide it. But one thing we need to remember is to always pray, not my will be done, but your will be done. Because he's a, he, God sees the whole deal from the end to the beginning. He knows what He's doing. We don't. We think we do. But we don't. He does know. And as a loving Father, we can trust His yeses and His noes. But let's take a look, because there's also conditions for answered prayer. Let's take a look at some of these conditions. Number one, how must one ask in order to receive? And James 1, 6 and 7 says, but let him ask in what? Faith. You know, we, we throw that word around, and most of the time we really don't even know what it means. If you have a problem, whenever you see that word in Scripture, just throw in the word trust, and it'll make sense. But let him ask in trust with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. And then again, Hebrews 11.6. But without faith or trust, trust, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently, what? Seek him. You know, when we distrust God, we are distrusting His love and power. And what we're doing is we're jeopardizing our request. Can you imagine, how would we feel as parents if each day our child came home saying, you know, is there really good, are you really going to feed me breakfast? I mean, is there really going to be food? I don't know, you know, is there really going to be food for, I mean, I, I'm just like, I, I mean, are, you, are we going to eat? Are we, you know, how would you feel as a parent if they question your love for them? You know, that would hurt, wouldn't it? And, 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 and so something about the rules of engagement, when we don't trust God, it jeopardizes His ability to intervene. It's really interesting, there is a story in Mark chapter 9 in the Bible of a father who had a child that was demon-possessed. And Jesus uh, shows on the scene, and this father brings his son to Jesus and says, My son has been possessed, <coughs> and the demons throw him into the water, into the fire to destroy him. And then he asks the question, uh, he, he said to him, if you are able, can you cast out the demon? And Jesus said to him, to those who believe. And it was really interesting because at that moment, the father recognized that his lack of trust jeopardized his son's healing. And then he said something very interesting. He looked at Jesus and he said, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. And it was so amazing, Jesus turned around and healed his son. That was an honest prayer. He was struggling. He says, look, I know you can do it, but I'm struggling right now. Will you help me? And uh, God responded to that. Isn't that cool? Isn't that amazing? But, uh, but it's very important. And you know, it's hard to trust someone that you don't know. 
It really is. I mean, I think that's reasonable. I think God thinks that's reasonable. That's why it's so important to spend time with God daily. To get to know what He's like. You know, I have fellow Christian friends who come to me and many times will paint these terrible pictures of what, you know, there's something we're working towards that I think is going to happen. And I'll look at them and I'll say, I'm sorry, but I reject what you have just said. God has promised. And then I'll claim the promise. And I, I just want to say, I'm sorry, I reject that. I will, I, you know, when God promises, he's going to help us. How can, we, how can we worry about something else? Do you know what I'm saying? We just got to sit tight and let God work out his deal. And trust Him. But see, I have come to know God. And I'm coming to know God. I'm not saying I'm, I, my, my faith is perfect. I'm not saying that. But I have enough experience with Him to know He has never bailed on me. God has never hung me out to dry. He never has. Are you with me? He actually knows what He's doing. We don't. And so we can actually trust Him. Are you with me? You know what? It's a beautiful thing. Isaiah says, Thou will keep Him in perfect peace. Whose mind is stayed on thee. Why? Because he trusts in thee. That's right. We can trust a loving God who has our best interest in mind. Number nine. Is that am I on nine? Yeah. Under what condition does the Lord hear prayer? Uh, 1 John 3.22 says, And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep, keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And of course... Uh, we're going to spend a little time studying the commandments, but the Ten Commandments is a reflection of His will. Do you remember, by the way, that lady that offered me those tickets? I was going to have to lie to get them. Could God have blessed that? No, because it's a violation of His law. God, God would not have blessed that, and I knew that, so I backed away from the bait. Now, did God provide for me? It was a little weird how it came about, but he did do it, isn't that right? How he gets it done is his business. I just need to wait on him. Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard iniquity or sin in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Now, let me explain why that's true. Okay? The Bible says that the wages of sin is... Yeah. All right. So suppose that I... Um, um, let, well, let me use an illustration. Um, suppose Seth comes over to me and uh, he comes over here. He wants to come to my house and ride my daughter's horse. So Seth is standing right there and he says, uh, Pastor Bounty, is it okay if I come over to your house and, and ride Sarah's horse? Now, what Seth doesn't realize is that he got, I have a heater here because it's winter. He got too close to the heater and his clothes just caught fire. Okay. So he's asking me, can I ride? And, me, and meanwhile, I can see that his, the bottom of his coat just got fire. But he's not aware. Now, what would you think of me if I went, well, let's see, are we going to be home that weekend? Um, <laughs> yeah, I think. What, what would you think of me being aware of his situation if I responded to his request? Think too highly of There's something wrong with me. Yeah. What would you expect me to do? Put the fire out. Put the to fire ignore out. the request and to pay attention to the larger issue. You see, when there's sin in the life, when we are rebelling against God, and then we make a request of Him, we're putting God in a bad spot. He wants to answer our request, but there's a larger issue in our life that is placing us in jeopardy. So God has to say, child, I would love to answer your request, but there's something else we need to pay attention to and take care of right now. And then, so I'm going to have to ignore that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's a loving God that says, I'm sorry, I'm not going to pay attention to that while this is going on. Make sense? Mm -hmm. And so we, you know, many times, <clears throat> if I'm asking for something and, you know, because not, not all our prayers are answered right away, and I'll, I'll say, Lord, I just want to make sure, is there anything between us that, that I need to be made aware of? And if nothing comes to my mind, I'm good with it. I'll know that God is working on something else and I just need to wait. But sometimes God will bring something to my mind and say, hey, you know, you were patient with your wife. Go over there and apologize to her. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? So <clears throat> it's very important that we recognize what God is saying there. So if we know there's something not right, we need to go to the Lord and have that taken care of. Number 10. When praying, what must we do in order to be forgiven? 
Uh, Mark 11.25 says, And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive, forgive him. him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. And, you know, one of the ways in which many folks, even folks in the church, sin, is that they refuse to forgive somebody. Now, now forgiveness doesn't mean that it excuses what that person did or justifies it. It just releases them to the Lord. Jesus, are you with me? We, God forgave me <laughs> for what I did. He forgave you. And he wants us to be willing to forgive others. Does that make sense? You with me? Okay. So let's take a look because the Bible also talks to us about a time, place, and the content of prayer. Let's take a look at number 11. What example did Jesus give of how to start each day? In Mark 1.35 it says, Now in the morning. morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Isn't that amazing? The same God started his day every day by praying to his Father. What an example for us. And, and, and that's exactly true. Just like the sanctuary services began in the early morning, and Israel, was, and Israel was taught to pray and to consecrate themselves to the Lord. Jesus began his day that way. And that's the way we're to begin our day. Each day early in the morning. Why in the morning? When does a soldier put on his armor? Before the battle or after? Before. Before, Before the battle. Otherwise, I remember an old pastor said to me, if you wait until the end of the day to have your prayer time, you're going to end up with a loser's prayer. Lord, I'm sorry I did this, I'm sorry I did that, I'm sorry I did this. But if you start in the day and armor up and ask God for strength and courage and wisdom for the day, laying out all your plans, then God has a right now to direct and to guide you through your day. Does that make sense? So we put our, our armor on before the battle. Uh, number And you know, by the way, the sanctuary actually is a model for prayer. Did you know that? Each day we come to the Lord. We make sure there's no sin between our soul and our Savior. We consecrate ourselves to Him. We ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We spend time, uh, and we go to His Word, where He provides our needs, we present our needs to Him, and then we intercede for other people. It's a model for prayer. But we begin in the morning. Number 12. What did Jesus say concerning secret prayer? Matthew 6.6 6 says, but you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is where? In, in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you how? Openly. Openly. And you know, <clears throat> when I can, I like to kneel before God when I pray. It's a reminder to me that He is awesome, and I'm not. It's a reminder that, that He is big, and he can, he can fix my problems. When I kneel before Him, He is my Creator, my Savior, my friend. And I like to, but that's not the only way to pray. Sometimes I pray in my bed. Sometimes I pray when I'm driving down the road. One of the ways that I really enjoy, I like to prayer walk. I like to multitask. So I'll start my day going to the little Fletcher. I guess I'm pointing the wrong direction. Let me think. No, maybe it was person. Was I pointing the right mm -hmm. way? No, it's over there. And terrible sense of direction. But <clears throat> I like to begin my day by uh, spending it with the Lord in prayer, and I, and I walk. And, and one thing I do is I have little cards uh, where I have various prayer requests. I pray for you all each day. I want you to know that. So I'm going for my walk. I'm lifting you all up in prayer. And uh, my children, since they were little, so I think I should do this with Josh was five and, my, and Sarah was one, but I began praying for their spouses. I don't know if I've met them yet. But uh, I've been praying for their spouses and for their parents, wherever they are. And so each day, I, I like to prayer walk. I like to pray out loud. When I used to live in the city, walking down the streets, praying out loud was a little strange. When I ran into people on the porches. But, uh, but I don't run into that. I try to be aware. Uh, but, there, but, but, you know, and, and we can pray in our minds. Uh, but, but prayer time with God, talking with God, is a very personal and intimate time with Him the time that we have. And isn't it awesome that even though the whole world is full of people, that when we pray, God listens to us as though there isn't another soul in all the earth. Yet we have His undivided attention. I think that's so amazing. Now let's continue. Uh, number 13. With what should our prayers be mingled? Philippians 4, 6. Um, be anxious for nothing. 
Are you anxious? <laughs> Want something? Here's a text for you. God is saying, don't be anxious. Be anxious for nothing, but everything by prayer and supplication. With what? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. Dear friend, when you gave your life to Jesus, you become part of the royal family. And so when, you, when we make our petitions, we are asking a petition of the king of the universe. And uh, he says, hey, hey, don't be anxious. Tell me what's, what's troubling you. And, uh, and we can, then he says, with thanksgiving, why? Because we're praying to someone who really cares and has the ability to intervene. And so it's being thankful is showing confidence that God is going to do something. Uh, Sarah taught me about confidence. How many of you see my daughter? Here yeah. She's a shorty. I call her my little shrimp, but she's not offended. <laughs> I always send her a little shrimp picture on the I text her. Not always, but oftentimes. And I tell her, I miss my shrimp. But when she was about three years old, she was a real shrimp. But, um, and she was real talking. I, mean, I think she was born talking. But she was really little. And one day, Mom had, and it was Daddy-Daughter time, and uh, we were walking down uh, a street in Lincoln, Nebraska. And it was there by the university. And Dad was deep in thought, like dads often do. And I wasn't paying attention to where we were going. And Sarah was on a little wall. I mean, what child can resist a wall, right? So she was walking along the wall. And I was walking beside her, deep in thought, not paying attention that, this, that this, the, the road was starting to go down, 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 down. But the wall didn't. The wall stayed straight. So I was going down, 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 while Sarah was going up, 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 up. And um, I had gone down quite a bit and turned the corner when I heard a voice above me call me Daddy. And I looked up in time. She was airborne. She jumped. Oh, wow. She had the biggest grin on her face because she just knew I was going to catch her. She, I knew that she had jumped before I, before I looked up. And just caught her, and she just thought that was great, scared me half to death. But you know, it really taught me something about her confidence. She knew I was going to catch her. And so when we thank God before we see the answer, it is showing our confidence in Him. That we know He's going to answer. He's going to take care of that. I want you to remember this. When you go to your knees to pray, the devil and his hosts tremble. Why? Because he knows on the other end of that prayer is a God who cares, and he's going to mobilize Heaven's Strategic Air Command. God is about to get involved. Are you with me? Don't wait until you see it, because you don't need faith. You don't need trust for that. You can see it. Just trust. When you go to your knees, you know he's listening. And get up and go about your day and let the Lord take care of the deal. Are you with me? Okay. Uh, let's go to number 14. How often should we pray? <laughs> Ephesians 6.18 says, Praying how? Always. Always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Now that doesn't mean you're, you're going to be on your knees all day long. What that's saying is be in an attitude of prayer. Okay? In other words, uh, be, have a mindset that you're, you're ready to call God in any, in any, any situation. Um, one of the things that helps me to stay connected to the Lord is thanking Him for things He does for us. Uh, you know, that beautiful flower that day that you saw. Thank you for the beautiful flower. When you, uh, on that day of the drive home, that beautiful sunset, uh, that was all those colors that were just splashed on the canvas of the sky. Hey, God could have just had the sun go whoop without all that beauty. He could have just had it drop. Instead, you know, he, he, he knew the route you were taking that day. Come on. Thank Him. Uh, when you woke up in the morning and that little uh, that cardinal was outside your window singing, thank you, and just maintain that connection. But but being in a in a prayerful attitude is getting is just when the moment you're into a problem, take it to him. Uh, before before I mow the lawn, I pray for God's protection. Mowing the lawn, Pastor? Oh yeah, yeah. I've known of people hitting a nail and getting a nail right through their eye. I know one that had that happen. Don't think that something weird won't happen to you mowing the lawn. And uh, so I asked God for protection. I remember the day <laughs> I had a friend come over to help me put in a countertop. 
I didn't know how to put it on a countertop, but he had experience, and so we were friends. He was going to come over. I bought all the gizmos and all the equipment. So he came over, and as we were getting ready uh, to start, I said, hey, look, let's, uh, let's pray. And he was, a, he was a friend of mine from church. I said, let's, let's pray before we get started. And he looked at me really weird. What? Pr uh, oh, okay. So we prayed. And uh, when we were done praying, he looks at me and he says, why did we pray? Nothing went wrong. And I said, I prayed so that nothing would go wrong. <laughs> did that make sense? Uh -huh. And so he kind of chuckled. He had never thought about it. And so he developed the attitude of inviting God into all of his projects. But, um, but let's remember to just have an attitude of prayer. Just like the flower, the sunflower turns to the sun as it moves across the sky, let's have that attitude. Focus on the Lord. Anytime we have a situation, take it to Him right away. And when you do that, you'll be surprised how often you talk to the Lord throughout the day at work. Well, let's take a look at some of the things, uh, examples that, of things to pray for. Now, what we're going to look at is very interesting. It's a list of things that God actually asks us to pray for. Now, let me ask you a question. If God asks you to pray for it, do you think that maybe He's a little anxious to provide it for you? Remember, he's a gentleman, he won't force. So he's saying, look, I want to give this to you. Pray for it. Is that cool? Isn't that awesome? So these are the things he asks us to pray for. He asks us to pray for forgiveness of sins. He wants to forgive us. He asks us to pray for the Holy Spirit, to empower us, to live a, an obedient life, to stay close to him. He, uh, he asks us to pray for deliverance in the hour of temptation and danger. He asks us to pray for wisdom and understanding. How many need some of that? He asks us to pray for it. He asks us to pray for the healing of the sick. Uh, he asks us to pray for the prosperity of the ministers of God. They need prayers too. He asks us to pray for those who suffer for the truth's sake. Hey, let me pause right there. If you don't think people are paying the price today for Christianity, you, you, we live in a sanitized world. You get on the internet and, uh, and do some research on Christians who are right now being martyred. Uh, you know, really interesting, I'll share something here. In, in the Muslim world right now, uh, Muslims are coming over to Christianity in droves. And the reason being is because of ISIS. Uh, ISIS, of course, is, um, is, a, is a renegade, if you, if you will, uh, there's another word I'm looking for, extreme version of the, of the Muslim faith. And it's opened the eyes to Muslims that, uh, for many Muslims, that they're their faith is bankrupt, and they're, they're embracing Christianity, but they're paying for it with their lives. They found something better, and they're willing to die for it. I, I won't even tell you the images of, of what's being done to these poor people, but, uh, but, but they found something worth dying for. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. I, I want to share with you, and I, I shared this along the way, but I fully believe that uh, Christ's return is very soon. And we're going to study that. What does the Bible say about the return of Christ? The return of Christ is very, very soon. This thing has gone on long enough. Anyway, uh, for those who suffer for the truth's sake, and by the way, I pray for them. And I hope you all join me in doing that. God will give them courage and strength. Uh, also, for the rulers, do you think Trump needs prayer? Oh, boy. How would you like to be the, the president of the United States? Or of any other nation? We need to pray for our rulers. God also wants us to pray for our enemies. He loves them too. Temporal prosperity, that the work of God may not be hindered. Uh, that the Lord to vindicate his cause for laborers, for the coming of Jesus, and for our needs. And this is just a sampling from Scripture. But these are things that God wants us to be praying for. Number 16. If an answer does not come at the time and in the manner expected, what should be our attitude? Psalms 37, 7 says, rest in the Lord and wait how? Patiently. Patiently, Patiently for Him. You know, when I uh, was in college, you know, when you're a young person, the big thing is who you're going to marry, right? Right? It hasn't been that long ago. <laughs> but uh, that, that's the big deal. And, uh, and I, you know, I did the dating scene, much to my regret, and after that uh, experiment, I realized I didn't know what I was doing. And so I went to the Lord and I said, okay, I thought, you know, God is so brilliant. Um, 
I don't know what made me do this, but I wrote out like a two-page paper of what Mrs. Wright was going to be like. Two pages. <laughs> wrote it out. And God, in his great wisdom, I just pictured him looking over my shoulder, and he said, okay, coming right up. And I actually bumped into the girl who, who fit the two-page paper. And I was perfectly miserable. And it was after that experience that I really realized I didn't know what I was doing. So I just asked the Lord to go ahead and pick for me. Okay? And so I went about my business, and months later, uh, I bumped in. By the way, the girl was in North Carolina. I was in California when I prayed the prayer. <laughs> By the way, she was praying for the Lord to lead her to the right guy. So she, he flew her out to California. And we met out there. And you know, we've been married now. It'll be 30 years this fall. And every year, God looks smarter and smarter. You know? We can't trust Him. His timing may not be ours. But if we wait patiently, It'll make sense. The delay will make sense later. He knows what he's doing. Number 17. What if I don't pray just right, or worse, I don't know what to pray for? Have you ever been there? Roman, uh, Romans 8.26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession, intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Okay, let me translate for you. In our stammering speaking, we make our request. And the Holy Spirit knows what we mean, translates it, delivers it to Christ, who then presents it to the Father. He presents it the way we would have if we knew how to pray it just right. So don't worry if you, don't, if you feel you're not praying just the right way. The Holy Spirit will take care of that. Does that make sense? I love that. There, I have been in situations, too, where I've gone to my knees and I've said, Lord, I don't know what to pray for at this moment, but I'm asking you, please, do something. He can work with that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. He can work with that. So, what are we learning? We're learning how to remain a Christian. And one of the ways is through opening up that line of communication to a God who hears who cares and has the power to respond. Are you with me? Praise the Lord. Well, our next talk, uh, we're going to take a look. We're going to pull it all together. We're going to look at a presentation called The Daily Today. We're going to take a look at the daily experience of ancient Israel and how does that apply to us today. But let's close out. Oh, wait. We have uh, an appeal. Like Israel of old, are you willing to spend time with your heavenly best friend at the start and at the end of each day in prayer. And you can apply your answer right there on the bottom. And let's close out with prayer. Father in heaven, we are so thankful that you are a real God, a Amen. real friend. You are our Father in heaven. You are our creator. You care about us. And uh, there are many things that we have to learn <clears throat> in, this, in this conflict between good and evil. But tonight we learned there's actually a science to prayer. And... Um, and so, Lord, I pray that we will study this document and uh, spend time in your word learning about who you are. It's hard to trust someone we don't know, but you know that. That's reasonable. That's why you introduce yourself to us through your son and in your word. So help us, Lord, to spend that time with you and to know that we can trust you and wait upon you to work things out for us, that you know exactly how to resolve the most challenging, difficult, and seemingly impossible situations in our lives. Thank you. We praise you. And now, Lord, I ask for your blessings upon each as they head for home. Grant them traveling mercies tonight. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And amen.